Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ron Line Report. Today's guest, you may recognize him. He is an IPB Pro League judge. He's an IPB Pro League professional bodybuilder. And uh, he has some very, very good insights as to things that have been going on with our industry, with the health of the athletes, uh, some things that really need to be talked about. So without further ado, Victor Prisk, how are you, sir? Hi, Ron. It's great to be with you again. Glad um, to be here. Yeah, so uh, I guess the best place, we're doing this on a Saturday. And just a couple hours ago, we learned that 2018 Mr. Olympia, Sean Roden has passed away. Just a, hmm. a month or so ago, we lost George Peterson. Not long before that, John Meadows. It, it seems to be almost an avalanche of premature deaths that we've been seeing this year. And uh, a lot of people are speculating, I'm sure you're going to address this, that it, it might be related to interactions of these various COVID vaccines with steroids, uh, with conditions that steroids bring about. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of rampant speculation from, from us lay people who don't have any medical expertise or insight. So that's why I'm glad that you offered to come on and, and have this discussion. So I'm going to leave it to you as to where you'd like to begin. Well, Ron, it's, it's really sad to me knowing all three of those great individuals in our community, Sean Roden, um, John Meadows, and, um, and George Peterson were all just like loved people. I mean, no distaste for them in anybody's minds. Um, and I, uh, it's very saddening to hear of, um, of Sean's death this morning. And, um, and it, it does make me really want to come out and talk about some of the things that are happening in our world when it comes to, you know, our, just how, for instance, the COVID-19 virus and how it affects our systems and then how the interactions of things that we tend to do in physique sports that could potentially, you know, co-mingle with that problem. Um, and uh, just kind of get a sense of what's happening because it seems like most of these deaths are, are related to something cardiovascular. Yeah. And in my practice as an orthopedic surgeon who also does wellness, my practice is Prisk Orthopedics and Wellness. So mm -hmm. we look at the entire organism. We look at everything from your hormones and how they affect your your, um, your health and your joint health. And, and we help with um, medically assisted weight loss and things that we can do to help your joints feel better as well as you feel better. So when it comes to all this, I see a lot of things that are trending in that patient population that I see that's around um, uh, physique enhancement, strength athletes and people who are, all, are also doing um, the supplement side, the gear side of things. And so, and how that may interact with what's happening in our communities these days. So um, I'd like to start with the fact that if most of these deaths are occurring around cardiovascular problems with, that could be related to clotting, such as strokes, heart attacks, pulmonary embolus, we do know that um, in COVID-19, we get something called a cytokine storm it's an inflammatory response. And when it gets really bad, it can you know, result in pulmonary emboli. It can result in microclotting in the microvasculature of the brain um, and the lungs, and then causes this severe damage, whether it be death from uh, the cardiovascular complication and or um, the uh, complications that occur in the lungs with hypo, you know, um, you, you end up with a hypoxia situation um, that can also lead to damage in those locations. So um, I think there's a, a little bit of a perfect storm that occurs in athletes who are looking to get bigger. First of all, you know, just the extra weight and the extra stress on your heart is always a challenge. And in COVID, we know that um, overweight individuals are at some of the highest risk. Um, obesity associated with um, uh, type two diabetes and previous cardiovascular disease. Uh, are all risks of death in, from the virus. So that being said, um, we also know that um, when we are doing physique enhancement, especially using gear, um, you end up with a situation called polycythemia. And one of the biggest trends that I've seen in my practice is people who come in 
say, hey, you know, I've been on gear. I want to know um, how I'm doing. And I'm always open to helping people find out, you know, just, you know, I'm not going to be judgmental and say, hey, you have to stop all this stuff. Although it's, I don't condone it. I think it should all be watched very closely if you decide to go that route. And the, what I'm seeing is people aren't watching closely. And so they haven't even gotten simple labs like uh, a CBC or an h and to find out what their red blood cell count is like. And a lot of these um, substances were originally made in order to um, treat anemia. So they inherently increase our red blood cell count. So if you think about that, the red blood cells are, the higher your hematocrit is, the more viscous your blood becomes, the, the more chances that you have of um, you know, sludging. If you get dehydrated at all, um, that increases even more. And when I even have people come in and they want to do something called platelet-rich plasma injections, when I draw their blood and I spin it down, I always see this really, and in, in, in bodybuilders, I tend to see that they really don't produce a lot of serum because their hematocrit is so high. I get this little measure of their hematocrit. It, it um, just shows that they have very thick blood and they never knew it. So then I send them from blood work and then you know, they find out that their you know, hematocrit is like 52. And when you're over 50, it's, it's really bad. So we, we need to get therapeutic phlebotomies going. So um, I'm not saying that it happens to everybody, but it happens to a lot of individuals mm. and they don't know it. And if that happens for a long period of time, you have elevated blood pressure, um, you are overweight when you're trying to do your gaining and your, your, uh, your, in your mass cycle or your, uh, in your off season and you're uh, just trying to bulk, you're eating a lot of, uh, a lot more calories than you need. You're, everything's in excess, right? Yeah. Uh, and we know that everything in excess causes problems. Um, everything in moderation, including moderation though. Hmm. Um, <laughs> that being said, you, you end up getting um, this extra stress on the heart, this um, uh, high hematocrit um, puts stress on your kidneys, the stress on your kidneys because the sludging of the blood ends up causing your kidneys to sense that Maybe there's not as much blood flow coming. So then it raises your blood pressure and it gets into this cycle of badness um, that now you throw at it a, a virus that causes a cytokine storm or this added inflammation in your body. Um, and that again, causes more platelet formation. Uh, platelets are, a, um, are these little bags of growth factors that we use for orthopedics and like by concentrating, but it also goes to your cuts and starts forming the clot. It releases those growth factors and things, but it's a, it's what we call an acute phase reactant. It raises in times of stress in times of, um, even infection and things like even the virus. Um, so we can see this rise in your red blood cell count. We see this rise in your platelets. We get more clotting and, um, all it takes is somebody to go on a trip, fly on a plane, get a pulmonary embolus. All you have to do is, is be feeling a little ill, a little sick, a little dehydrated. You get a blood clot. Um, so you add on top of that, and then there's the risk that we're seeing with the J and J vaccine, um, with the added risks there of possible, um, blood clotting. And that could be also another, uh, situation where you end up, you know, having these risks. And so, um, when you look at a bulking bodybuilder, at least you're looking at someone who, um, is, is pretty much acting like an obese individual. Um, you may think you're healthy, but you, you may not be. And, uh, you add on top of that, um, some of the oral gear that you do, especially when we're talking about the uh, anabolics that are oral affecting your liver and affecting your clotting factors, affecting your, um, uh, your ability to, um, just clear toxic substances in general, um, you end up having another ad additional um, shock to the system, more inflammation. Um, if you um, add in uh, something like an anti-estrogen, now you're even making it worse because estrogen is important for um, uh, vascular, endothelial function, vascular endothelial function. So that your endothelium, which is in your blood vessels, kind of controls that permeability, that contractility of the uh, arteries. Um, and then of course, um, the inflammation that can cause plaques. Uh, so that means if you have a, a higher LDL and a low HDL, you start forming more inflammatory plaques in your arteries that, uh, can then lead to, you know, atherosclerosis and heart disease and, uh, thus, uh, heart attacks. Give me one second. So, Sorry. yep. 
All right, sorry about that. There's a little, little noise, noise outside that someone's doing their yard work. But, um, um, you know, the conspiracy theorists and the alarmists, everybody on Facebook, the vaccine is a huge, huge issue in general. But particularly now, we've seen this rash of, it seems like an avalanche of deaths. And these people aren't dying while they have COVID. And we don't know who's vaccinated and who's not. So we can't yeah. automatically say, you know, when Meadows had his pulmonary embolism, immediately I thought, did he have the Johnson Johnson vaccine? Because I got that and the very first day I got it, they recalled the vaccine, at least temporarily, because people were experiencing clotting issues. So a lot of people are jumping to that conclusion. And I don't know if it's premature. We're uninformed. I, I, I don't think we should jump to that conclusion. But we have to keep in mind that there could be correlations there. But it, it's not really about, you know, should you get vaccinated? Is it dangerous? This and that. Um, hmm. The studies do show that getting vaccinated is the best way to go, if, especially if you have any risk factors. Um, it, it, in my own hospital, we know that if you are coming in and you, we are diagnosing you with COVID, you are more likely to end up in the ICU if you have not had the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And um, people who have had the vaccine tend to have very mild symptoms. And most of the time we're finding COVID as a um, almost a second thought. We just checked for it and it's there, but the patient didn't even know it. So uh, getting the vaccine has definitely been shown to be effective with regards to limiting the course of the disease and the severity of the disease. And uh, I do recommend getting it if um, you don't have any objections to it. And now people have their own objections to it and they have their own risk factors. Like they may have a clotting factor risk. They may want not want to get it. And I, I can understand that mandating it. It's a whole other political thing. But so um, when it comes down to it, uh, we have to also think about what it is if you do get COVID and what it's, how it's affecting your system regardless. So the, the whole idea here is to understand what your risk factors are. And it's just because you're a bodybuilder who's in shape and who's um, working out twice a day uh, does not mean that you are in the best of cardiovascular health. It's, it doesn't mean that your system is ready to take on challenges. Um, it also doesn't mean that in the long run, you haven't done some damage. So the, the fear I have is, you know, if mostly the people we've seen pass away recently have had previous cardiovascular problems, um, maybe they have a family history and um, just have to realize that the lifestyle of, you know, your weight going up and down and, you know, eating tons of calories at one point and less at another and all these fluctuations in weight just uh, don't lend well to good cardiovascular health. Yeah. So, um, and then you add on top of that, some of the contest prep techniques and that's another story, right? Yeah. So we yeah. start worrying about people starting to use diuretics and, and some of the things I see online and some of the people who come in to see me and they've been told to do these protocols using diuretics, which is absolutely horrendous, the things that I'm seeing. Uh, I can tell you flat out that uh, using a diuretic to do a, a bodybuilding competition only made physiques that I've worked with worse and physiques, my own physique, it made it worse the one time that I thought, ah, maybe I'll give it a little try of something and it just made my physique worse. It makes you, well, water is important for hydrating your muscles and making them look full and you do that, you do this. Most people are doing the diuretics I, not that I did the diuretics that are trying to make up for the fact that you're not in shape. And if you're not in shape, you can't do anything to look in shape. So it's, if you're using them to get into a show, no matter what your size or what your status or whatever it is, you are doing something wrong. Yeah. Period. I mean, we were seeing some of these protocols that were being shared. Um, I won't name coaches names or anything, but some of these people were being put on diuretics seven to 10 days out from a competition, which boggles my mind. I mean, how much time do you really need to expel whatever amount of water you're holding? It, it, it can't, yeah. it, it just doesn't even make sense to me. Uh, You've got people who think- Is there any situation that where somebody would need to be on diuretics for 10 days before a contest? Never. I mean, there never is a need to be on it, period. I mean, there's just no need for it. If you're in shape, you can manipulate the amount of water you're drinking if you need to and get things under control without them. And all you end up with with those is uh, you, you end up with electrolyte imbalances, uh, loss of potassium, um, 
you know, even just the, some of the malnutrition you have sometimes going into these shows because you think you need to cut down so much more or you're really trying to make it at the end, um, you know, the loss of magnesium, the, just the extra sweating and, and all this. And I see people trying to get into saunas and all that other stuff. It's just, just wrong. Uh, is you should not have to be trying to dehydrate into a show like that. Yeah. Um, and if, if your coach is telling you to do that, then you should find another coach. Um, yeah. If you are not ready for a show, do not be afraid to pull out of a show. Um, it's, it's a sport of timing when it comes to being in the best shape you can be. But if you try to force it with drugs, you're just going to end up killing yourself. So another, another topic that came up, you know, when that, unfortunately that the pro bodybuilder, uh, the woman, uh, her name escapes me at the moment. She passed away right before the uh, Alicante Spain show a couple months. Was it about, it's been about four months now. It happened over the summer and there was an outcry and they said something needs to be done we need to either institute diuretics testing or we're not going to reward extreme condition, which that's, that's impossible because you can't say this person looks that way because they use diuretics and this one didn't um, condition always. You're a, you're a, you're a judge. You judge at the level of the Olympia. You have to be looking for condition. Yeah. So let's address that first. Cause Jake Wood made a, a post shortly after that, the owner of the Olympia and said he met with Jim Mannion and, and uh, Dan Solomon. They talked about it, but you know, as a judge yourself and as a medical professional condition does it can we ever say well we're not gonna we don't want condition to be as extreme anymore we're not we don't want you people to you men and women to be as ripped and dry and shredded looking anymore you, you can't really say that you you have to say that you know everybody has a choice of what they decide to do with their bodies and their physiques and how they want to look the choice to do something stupid is your own choice. You can't say that because we look at a good ripped physique. You have people who are incredibly ripped, shredded, but they look like crap because they have no volume to their muscle and uh, their skin is not tight and this and that because it's not a matter of being de dehydrated. It's a matter of being full of water yeah. and lean. Yeah. So the people who are doing this to themselves are doing it because they either they're naive, they just don't know, they're being told by somebody who thinks they're an expert and proclaims to be the expert or proclaims to be the doctor of bodybuilding or something. I, I don't know what they want to call themselves, but a lot of them seem to act like they're doctors, the way they tell people to take things. And uh, the patients that come to see me saying they were told to take this, whether it be a diuretic or DNP or clenbuterol or this and that, all in combination, um, it sounds to me like some of these coaches tend to tell them, you know, as if from a doctor's advice. And I think that it's, um, it's an atrocious thing that the naive people or the people who just are coming into it are getting this kind of advice and, um, they have to take their own responsibility for what it is they put in their bodies. Yeah. And if they want to come on stage, um, being, uh, uh, completely dehydrated and things, we're going to catch it. We're going to see that you're you're struggling and you're going to be kicked off the stage and things. I'm not speaking from a judge's perspective or any organization's perspective. I'm just speaking from, uh, from sensibility, you know, yeah, yeah. If, if you, if you come into it, I mean, no sport on the planet, football, baseball, you name it is going to be drug free. Right. It's going to happen. Right. They're going to beat the tests. You could test all day long. People are going to beat tests. 100%. Um, 100%. It, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, you can, institute rules and say that we don't want to do this but in, in essence everybody's going to do what they want to do they have to take their own responsibility for it and um i think it's uh it, it, it's on the people who have been around for a while to explain to people that we really need to um listen to smart people and don't listen to stupid people we need to continue to um uh educate and share important things that um, can be done to help people uh, to find doctors like myself, for instance, who aren't afraid to look at your labs and to look at what, uh, what's happening with your hematocrit and you be honest with what you're taking so we can make sure that, you know, when you come to me, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna look at your labs and go, wow, you are effed up. And you're gonna realize, I've had many people come in and realize that they need to back off. They need to start doing something smarter. 
Um, what I see happening a lot is people get this junk gear, right? And so they keep escalating the doses and then they almost all of a sudden might get good gear and they're at that, so they think they need a thousand milligrams of test a week and, um, and or a thousand of EQ. And then you end up uh, with uh, this, this storm, you know, of, of badness. Um, and it's just like the, the heroin addict who uh, all of a sudden gets some heroin that's laced with fentanyl, you know, yeah. and they end up having a, an overdose. Yeah. It can happen in bodybuilding too. It's a major problem because obviously most people use underground gear because, you know, we, that's what, that's all we can get. We can't get the farmer grade stuff. This isn't 1985 anymore. So unfortunately we have stuff that's underdosed, it's contaminated, it's got heavy metals in it. You know, it's, it's frightening what we put in our bodies as bodybuilders. But the, 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 the yeah, the contaminants are, are even more worrisome because you think about the benzyl, benzyl alcohol, the benzyl benzoate, the preservatives that they put in there. And if you look at their toxicology of those substances, they're being put into these bottles in excess mm -hmm. um, to prevent infection or, to, you know, um, just keep it clean. And, and so whatever happens in your system from that, we just don't even know, you know, what could that be, be doing if. You yeah. inject something and all of a sudden you taste alcohol in your mouth. That's not right. Well, you know, man. that's, that's excessive amounts of preservatives, you know, um, which can be toxic from a cancerous perspective and from a cardiovascular and toxicology perspective from your liver. So yeah, I really mean, the, dangerous. The one compound that I, I try to steer people away from is these very highly concentrated testosterones and, and DECAs like the T400 was very popular because people are lazy if they can shoot 400 milligrams of uh, testosterone in one CC rather than, you know, two or two or more, they're going to do that. But the amount of benzyl alcohol that it takes to dissolve that much testosterone into one milliliter of oil is outrageous. I mean, most people experience incredible pain, post-injection pain. I've had it that it lasted for a week or more where the whole area would be completely red and hot to the touch and, you know, we've all, we've had people get abscesses, but these aren't yeah. deadly. These aren't going to typically won't kill you as long as you don't let an infection uh, go too far. But we are seeing this rash of deaths. And I hate to go back to COVID and the vaccines again, but, you know, a lot of bodybuilders are facing this question. Am I better off getting COVID? What are my chances of survival? Getting COVID and surviving or getting this vaccine that had to be rushed through to to deal with a global pandemic that we didn't have time to see what happens to people many months and years down the line after getting this vaccine. So I think a lot of people aren't getting the vaccine because it's an unknown, whereas they see people around them getting COVID who get sick for a few days or a week, maybe two weeks, and then they bounce right back. I mean, I've had most, most of the people in my close family have had COVID and they're perfectly fine now. You know, but I still got the vaccine just because I mean, I, I've I seen close there. friends die from it, you know, and they were perfectly healthy. So mm. um, two of my staff members, parents passed away from it, and they were both very healthy 70 year old guys. Wow. Um, one was uh, an avid uh, runner. The other one was a dancer. I mean, things are uh, it's pretty crazy um, how dangerous the virus can be. Uh, people tend to undersell that idea like, well, maybe it's just a cold virus and this and that, but no, it, 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 it really does have a different effect, just like the, the SARS virus and, and things that had these inflammatory responses that were pretty excessive and lead to significant, um, pulmonary, uh, injury. So, um, I think that, you know, everybody has to make their own decision about it, but the data says that getting the vaccine limits your ability, your limits your chances of ending up in the ICU and dying. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been enough vaccines given at this point where we're not seeing massive numbers of complications from it to suggest that it shouldn't be given. Um, you know, is this gonna become one of those things just like a flu vaccine where we're, it's gonna be offered every season um, and the seasons might be different for this? Yes, uh, it probably will because this is a, uh, epidemic problem when it comes to the, the vaccine, the uh, virus is going to continually mutate. It's what the flu virus does. You're always seeing different strains. Um, we're gonna be seeing that going forward. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So um, getting a vaccine is something that if, if it's safe between you and your physician, they say that it's safe for you to get, you should get. 
If they tell you, well, your risk factors are too high or it's not appropriate for you to get, then, then go with your physician's advice. Um, I would not uh, go with whatever is being told on the media of any kind, Facebook. whether it be, whether it be Facebook yeah. um, or any other sources. You, it's a decision you make between you and your doctor. Uh, unfortunately, they're making it more of a decision you make between you and your employer and things like that. But, you know, uh, I'm not going to get into that political debate, but I think Absolutely. that it is something where you should get it when you, um, when you know that it's safe for you to get Okay. Well, I guess let's, let's finish up this way because a lot of steroid using bodybuilders are not going to stop using steroids for whatever reasons. Maybe they, maybe they're professional and this is part of what they feel they need to do to keep up with the Joneses and to have that look, or maybe they're just a recreational user. Many of my viewers watching this are steroid users and they have no intentions of stopping, but they don't want to die. So if we come to you as a patient and say, I'm a steroid user, I'm not going to stop taking steroids. What do you suggest I do so that I can stay alive and be as healthy as possible, given my steroid abuse, because it is abuse. Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, as a physician, we don't want to see people hurting themselves. But at the same time, you know, there are a lot of docs out there who will, as soon as you walk in, you look big, you have that plethoric bodybuilder look, people are going to say, hey, they're just going to give you a flat out stop. It's going to happen. And so it's hard to go to your doctor and say, Hey, you know what? I just want to find out how healthy I am or not. They're basically, there are going to be ones that are judgmental and ones that are not. I try to be non-judgmental about it. I try to tell you, you know, what it's doing to your system. So you can make the informed decision. Um, I think that people need to get regular blood work when they're using gear. Um, they should not be afraid to check whenever they're having any sorts of symptoms. They're feeling lightheaded. They're feeling chest pain, shortness of breath, any of these kinds of things. Fatigability is probably one of the most underlying um, signs that are, are often blown off. You know, you say, well, you know, this anadrol is just toxic to my liver or something. And it's making me fatigued. And, yeah. uh, you know, if I stop that, I'll be fine. But in reality, it could be something worse, like you're developing congestive heart failure and you don't even know it. Um, you're having microvascular clots. You don't even know it. You're getting pulmonary hypertension from your seat uh, your um your sleep apnea that you're not recognizing and you don't even know it. So these are all things that should be checked. If you haven't been checked for, if you have a 17 inch neck or bigger and you haven't been checked for sleep apnea, you should. Um, if you have, <laughs> you, you got a pretty big neck there. Uh, Ron. I have sleep apnea. When, I, I, when I was bodybuilding, I had a bigger than 17 inch neck and I had sleep apnea. Yeah. And um, getting on a, a CPAP device made a world difference for me at that time. I was able to get off of it when I lost weight. 50 pounds of mass, you know? So um, that, the polycythemia, the anti-estrogens and the overuse of them, um, whether or not you, you know, get labs to see if you are converting to estrogen and you're having estrogen side effects before you start using a little bit of an anti-estrogen is probably better than just gunning it and saying, you know what, my nipples feel sensitive. I got to take it. That could be a totally different thing causing your nipple sensitivity. You don't even know. It could be just the, the medications you're taking. Um, the anti-estrogen effects on your, ten your tendons and your cardiovascular health can be hor horrendous. Um, so, you know, realizing, um, especially during cutting phases and things about uh, how to do that safely, um, seeing what's happening to your thyroid, seeing what's happening to your metabolism in general, um, making sure you're staying well hydrated, looking at your, your um, electrolytes and your kidney function. Um, those are all things you should watch as you go. And if you see things getting out of, out of whack, you realize you did something wrong and you need to back off. And uh, a good doctor will tell you, you know what, you don't look good on paper. That's for sure. Uh, as good as you look, you don't look good on paper and you need to change something. Otherwise this will catch up to you. Hey, you may not catch up to you on this first show or the second show, or, you know, it might be 10 years from now that it catches up with you. Like some of these guys, I think is it happening. Um, but if you're paying attention to it, you, at least you have an informed decision to make and you've done it in a way that um, can be as safe as you can, yeah. so to I mean, speak. I, I do suspect, and you can, you can confirm or deny this, that the whole contest prep process, if you do it repeatedly over and over for years and years, like you said, losing, gaining up to 50 extra pounds, losing 50 pounds over and over, doing that to your body, it, can't, it has to be a tremendous stress to all the organs. I, I just, I Absolutely. suspect, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just like what we see in marathon runners, okay? Um, we know that if you run more than a certain number of marathons at a certain pace, like under eight minutes per mile um, over a number of years, you are just as high of a risk to have a heart attack as if you were a smoker. Wow. Um, there, was like, there was a good book called, uh, I think it was uh, Running to Die or, or uh, some, I think it was like Running to Die or some, some book like that where they went over this ultra marathoner's life and how he died of a heart attack. Um, and the same thing can happen in extreme sports like bodybuilding. So yeah. we need to just be aware of this. And, um, you know, every situation that we're seeing right now is individual. It's different. We don't know, you know, if there's any correlation between any of these deaths, but just the fact that we're talking about it more and people are talking about it is a good thing, I think, um, and getting us into a place where people will try and be safer about it, um, I do not think it has anything to do with what we say with regards to your um, look on stage. If you're going to have a good symmetric look and you have a tight abdomen and you're in good shape and you have good full muscles, we can't determine how you got that way. All we can say is how you look and how you present yourself. If you're upstairs, up on that stage and you're shaking and you're sweating and you're, um, you're bloated and you can't keep your belly in and something's happening there, um, we know, we know that there's a problem at that point, you know, it's not a healthy athlete that looks yeah. like that. And that person should be off yeah. the stage. Right. Yeah. I mean, personal responsibility is important. People need to be accountable for their own health and longevity. Um, I, you know, as much as it's, it's easy to point the finger of blame at an organization or officials, it's your body guys, it's your health. Especially if you're working with a coach, you should be knowing everything that's going into your body don't just, don't just take something because a coach tells you to. We all have phones and computers and Google and PubMed. There's, there's no excuse to be ignorant and uninformed these days. All that information is readily available. But you, you, I can understand where you know, just having been a bodybuilder myself and being a doctor and then looking at things that are being said online, a lot of times that isn't the way to go. You know, the way to go is to find a physician that will help you in staying healthy. If you are using all these different substances, you find somebody who can explain it to you from a, a little bit more of a, an informed position than just bro science. Okay. I, I, I literally, so, you know, in my practice, we see people from all over the world, you know, so we can look at all that kind of stuff. If you guys want to reach out, that's, yes. what that's is, cool. What is, your, what is your website, doctor? It's orthoandwellness.com, O-R-T-H-O yeah. and wellness.com and um we do virtual visits and things too so i'm not trying to sell my services here i'm just oh. trying to say that i'm i'm one of those people who are available there are a lot of people like me throughout the country um that are, are willing to give you informed decisions i even know some some phds who are very smart with this and do teach at schools and things uh, i know guillermo escalante i think is one that he, he likes to help people out with in this scenario um, and so sometimes it's not just, a, it's a physician, not always a physician, but it's somebody who really does know the science. Yeah. Um, and it, that might be hard to figure out. If you ever have any questions about that, we can help you with that too. Yeah. But um, I think uh, making these informed decisions on your own body is the most important thing. And, and just as it, if you would uh, go to the grocery store and you wouldn't buy something that had some crazy thing on the label that you didn't understand, you, if the front of the label said, methyl hydroxy butyrate something or other this and that and you go should i buy this and eat this it, mm. it says it's like the healthiest food on the planet right here mm. Mm, i would uh, you know get your doctor's opinion first yeah. something like that you know what i mean yeah i mean it's too many people try to be uh, their own doctors these days unfortunately or they just they don't want to know what's going on with their body so they avoid any contact with the medical with medical professionals which Obviously, that's a disastrous way to conduct your life as a bodybuilder, putting these things in your body and just it, hoping, it's sad that it's sad. And I, I apologize for the medical community for how judgmental they often are to these athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is something I see every time they come in when they find me and I say, um, you know, they went to an endocrinologist and the endocrinologist said, ah, you got to stop this and you can't do this and you can't do that. And um even when they've come off and they're shut down completely and all they want to do is get back to normal, they won't even help them. Yeah. They won't even suggest, okay, well, we can prescribe you clomiphene citrate and we can get you back online. 
Um, there's no reason why a physician can't do that for you. If you decide to start using again, we're going to see it in your labs. Yeah. And we're going to be like, what well, you're not listening to my advice. So bye bye. You know, you have to be have a physician uh, doctor patient relationship that has trust in it. Yeah. And um, I expect that from all of my patients. I tell them the risks of what they're doing. I tell them the risks, even if they go into doing hormone replacement. You know, if we decide to go that route, there are risks and there are reasons to, to discuss whether you have the same risks as if you were on steroids, because it's kind of the same thing, but you're doing it at a more controlled level and more physiologic level. But sometimes you're not so physiologic as we're trying to get there. So you might go high, you might go low, this could cause problems. So whether that be heart disease, whether that be um, uh, side effects of uh, gynecomastia or acne or hair loss, those kinds of things, we will recognize it, reel you in and make it right. But in the medical community, there's just so much judgment that is passed that has made people prefer to go to the internet more than to see an actual physician. So uh, I apologize to the bodybuilding community for, for that. And I think there should be a coalition of us doctors that can let you guys know who we are and where you can find us and you know how you can do things more safely. Great. Well, guys, you can find Dr. Prisk at orthoandwellness.com. Mm -hmm. I highly encourage you to seek medical attention and be monitored so you do know what's going on because sudden death is, you know, it's very, very common among bodybuilders as we're seeing lately. You don't want that to be you. I don't want that to be me. So Dr. Prisk, thank you so much for coming on today and, and having this discussion. It's critical. It's, it's literally a life or death matter now, as we see, it's no joke. It's uh, it's as serious as a serious as it gets. So appreciate it's you very much, doctor. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure. It's sad to see my friends, people like Sean, people um, like George go. I, I'm, I'm taken. Uh, it's 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 heart wrenching. So thank you, Ron, for letting me have this uh, time with you, and um, hope everybody um, is having a, a a safe and happy holiday season coming up, and and um, just enjoy your family. And uh, as I always say. You know, time is the only thing that we can't get back. So spend it wisely and spend it generously. Great. Well, thank you, Doctor. Everybody, thanks for watching Ryan Line Report with Dr. Visco Victor Prisk. And uh, please heed his words. Be safe, guys. Be well. You only have one life. That's all. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Ryan.